Well, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. I've been here for several days recovering from jet lag. <laughs> uh, so a very generous um, um, uh, hospitality I've been getting. Um, as uh, Sarah said, I recently published this article called um, The World Without a Self, Edward Hopper and Chantal Ackerman. Uh, and there I argued, argued that Hopper was interested in depicting an impersonal vision of the world, and that the best way he found of doing so was by staging paintings as if they were scenes from a vehicle. So a particularly good example is uh, the Circle Theatre. Um, it's a depiction based on what would have been visible through a windscreen of a car stopped at a red light in Columbus Circle in New York, circa 1936. The implied car has, so to speak, paused at a red light, framing a fragment of the city that is apparently random and accidental. There's so many layers of um, superimposition, the stoplight, the road, the traffic island, the empty newsstand, the entrance to the subway, which obscures the marquee <laughs> to the Circle Theatre, so you can only see the C and the E. <clears throat> this is a view of the theatre that no artist would choose to depict unless he or she wanted to convey something of the contingency, the arbitrariness of the world viewed from a car windscreen. It demonstrates the effect of using a car as a kind of apparatus that automatically frames an impersonal contingent field of vision. The windscreen functions as a large lens that automatically frames and focuses an image, rendering it quasi-independent of any personal subjectivity. In other words, the circle theater is a depiction of a view that implies a certain absence of self. It suppresses the look of deliberate composition in favor of depicting a world seemingly open to contingency. This characteristic practice follows from Halper's filmic or photographic sensibility, not that he took photographs, he just <laughs> was imbued with a sensibility, uh, a sensibility he shared uh, with uh, Edgar Degas. Uh, both incorporated camera effects in their paintings, including slant angles of vision, decentralized compositions, cropping, exaggerated differences of scale, and so on. Of course, the car can be, and very often is, a vehicle for self-assertion and empowerment. Um, and my fellow speaker, Jason Weems, has in fact argued this case uh, in the catalog essay um, very persuasively saying that um, the car provided Hopper with a means of discovering, claiming, and finally authoring the world. I think that is one way of looking at the case. I would argue, on the contrary, that circle theater typifies Hopper's use of the view from a vehicle as a deliberate suspension of agency, an acknowledgment of the impossibility of total optical mastery given the external determinants of perception. Hopper's vehiculated point of view obviously affects the way we encounter what is depicted in a painting as it determines what sorts of things are depicted. Um, obviously, gas stations, domestic architecture, hotels, motels, country inns, and so on. Hopper made paintings that implied views from elevated railways, trains, including the famous house by the railroad. Um, increasingly, though, he depicted the world as viewed from a car. Working on rooms for tourists um, in the show, we, he returned repeatedly night and day to make studies from the vantage point of a parked car. Um, I like the way in this uh, study, you can see that um, <clears throat> he cropped, deliberately just cropped the apex of the house's uh, pitched roof 
in order to convey this oblique, transient, um, restricted uh, field of vision. Hopper lived during and participated in the period of transition from mass railway transportation to mass automobile ownership. And this transition can be traced in the changing subject matter of his work. He and his wife, Jo, were early adopters of the car, having bought a big secondhand Dodge as early as 1927, during a decade when car ownership in the USA trebled. In this and subsequent cars, they sought out interesting subjects for painting that had suddenly become more accessible. But more important, uh, the car, like the train, became for Hopper a depersonalizing vehicle of perception. It is important, I think, to note the phenomenological differences between train and car travel. Uh, train uh, travel is, as one also often finds in uh, literature, um, uh, sort of conducive to a relaxed, passive reverie, a rather detached um, view of the world uh, as it slips by. Uh, this state of mind is not recommended for the car driver. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> train travel, what I'm saying, lends itself readily to inward reverie, even sleep. Uh, car driving demands outward attention, constant watchfulness, concentration, anticipation of possible obstacles. Um, however, in his article called The Road, Nicholas Robbins describes Hopper's sense of driving as having an inward meditative quality, uh, claiming that Hopper internalizes the view from the road as a mean of exploring the self. I would suggest, however, that the trance-like state induced by the monotony of the highway is rather different from what we'd call a proper reflexive uh, state of mind. Surely one of the reasons why Hopper continues to attract the attention of artists and filmmakers and critics is because he intuited early on modernity's flattening of experience brought about by the endless monotony, monotonous asphalt strip. His uh, late painting, Road with Trees, which I was just showing you, um, far from being, as Robin says, a personal impression, really reminds me of, and seems to anticipate, Andreas Gursky's digitally manipulated Rhine II. Um, in both cases, uh, generalized horizontal bands of color replace the complexity of nature. Well, these observations have implications for what is my main theme today, which concerns the differences between Hopper's depictions of interiors of hotels and motels. My argument can be encapsulated in the following analogy. Hotels are to trains as motels are to cars. I want to really unpack that formula by focusing just on two paintings and treating them as if they were pendants. I was interested that Car Carter um, Foster this morning was also talking about implied pendants in, in Hopper's work as having a, a then and now quality. So I want to think of them as kind of before and after diptych, uh, separated by 26 years of radical change in modes of transportation and American life. Uh, hotel Room, 1931, and Western Hotel, 1957. It's tempting to view the two as pendants, um, reflecting social and cultural changes that accompany the transition from train to car travel. After all, they have so much in common. There's a woman perched on the side of a bed in a temporary lodging with suitcases, an armchair draped with an article of clothing, and so on. However, in other ways, they are as different as night and day. For a start, they differ greatly in size, with hotel room being uh, considerably larger, uh, more imposing canvas. This is a, an approximation 
Um, but you can go look for yourself if you want to run from room to room in the exhibition. Uh, Hopper indicated hotel rooms association with train travel, uh, as we heard by the timetable, um, uh, which we know is one because that's what it says in the little ledger that uh, Joe wrote that it was a timetable. But also that distinctive concertina design hasn't changed. It has a portrait format. In fact, it's actually nearly square in format. And essentially, it's the portrait of an anonymous woman who's uh, lost in her own thoughts. Even in her state of semi-undress, the impression of an inward life, of some obscure unhappiness, I think, is palpable. Her body is bowed, her face in shadow, her gaze downcast. Hopper's sketch in the ledger shows her face with dents cross-hatching, making that um, case very clear. The space is compressed um, and um, there's darkness outside. The accoutrements are modest, uh, in keeping with the Depression era in which it was painted. Uh, the ledger speaks of overhead lighting, interestingly, kind of harsh overhead lighting. Uh, an imitation mahogany uh, bed and dresser. Uh, O'Doherty uh, has called this kind of look the unloved patina of public usage. <laughs> the narrative is left obscure, keeping the viewer in doubt about the woman's situation beyond, beyond the fact that she's away from home, obviously, alone, and judging by the narrowness of the bed, not expecting anyone. The timetable may uh, remind us that it was primarily uh, train travel that demanded uh, the imposition of standardized time. Modern metropolitan life demanded the synchronization of schedules and clocks and so on. Um, yet despite this rationalization implied by the timetable and this kind of stark uh, look of the room, the young woman nonetheless manages to convey, as I say, a sense of inner life. Um, what I think is that she's not consulting a timetable, which would be kind of banal, but rather it's a serious reflection um, at the crossroads of her life. This um, impression of inwardness, I think, is amplified uh, if you see in it an allusion to Rembrandt's Bathsheba. There are many obvious similarities. They both show a woman with reddish hair, lost in thought, sitting on the edge of a bed in profile, <laughs> holding a slip of paper above her knees. Furthermore, the canvases are almost identical in size and proportions. The allusion to Rembrandt raises hotel room above the commonplace. It clearly aspires to something of the grandeur of history painting, while at the same time acknowledging that the genre survives in severely reduced circumstances. It occurs to me that, that actually Hopper's Woman is kind of a condensation of the maid <laughs> and Bathsheba because the maid's face is so shrouded in, in darkness. And um, yeah, anyway. Now, next. I think we're moving not only forward in time, but um, West, in this case, Western Motel from east to west, painted in California in 1957. Again, a woman in a stripped down room with huge plate glass windows and a glazed door through which we can see the hood of a car, a road, and the distant mountains of the American Southwest, all in harsh sunlight. The ledger describes a deluxe green, green hotel room, so we've moved up in the world as well, <laughs> and a real mahogany bed. The painting has um, a landscape format, uh, really an exaggerated widescreen um, aspect. Um, and the modernity of the scene is, I think, underscored by the bold gaze of the woman She's described in the ledger as a haughty blonde. Um, her direct gaze may remind us of uh, Manet's Olympia, uh, a painting copper sketch on um, a visit to Paris. 
Both women are on display in the presence of someone who occupies our space. Um, and I think this structural dependence uh, or dynamic relation with someone who occupies the viewer's position um, organizes both paintings. You can see that um, structural dependence, as I say, on uh, a viewer outside in our hemisphere, the, 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 um, the viewer's hemisphere. Um, the art historian Robert Hobbes, I think, has uh, argued quite persuasively that um, we should imagine the woman as posing for a photograph. The scenario is, as it were, a photo op in front of a picture window with a spectacular view, either on arrival or departure, it's unclear. The painting is infiltrated by the mechanism of the camera before which the woman assumes a pose. I'm reminded of this remark that Roland Barthes made that when he's being photographed, he feels himself a subject becoming an object. <laughs> in my view, the painting is unintelligible unless we read it in this way. Otherwise, what motivates this outward gaze, this rigid pose, this peculiar fixity of her right hand? The selfhood of the woman is further compromised by her being compositionally conjoined to the car. Uh, it's a kind of mechanical prosthesis, which of course is what a car is. Um, at exactly the same date, um, Richard Hamilton was a um, British pop artist, was painting fetishized women merged with fetishized cars in a kind of critical spirit, I should add, uh, alluding to um, the proliferation, proliferation of automobile ads in the glossies such as this. In Western Motel, Hopper was drawing attention to the effects of our habitual machinic interface with the automobile and also to the way our vision is penetrated by lens-based media. Three decades earlier, he had depicted a woman affected by another sort of machinic interface. Automat is a painting that only makes sense if we imagine the part of the restaurant not depicted, um, what in film lingo is called the reverse shot, which is this. <laughs> Um, Horn and Harder, you know, coin-operated um, restaurant. The woman in Western Motel is um, in a position of total 360-degree uh, visibility. In um, The Human Condition, um, 1958, <laughs> The philosopher Hannah Arendt described our need for the, dark, the darkness of sheltered existence, a twilight that suffuses our private, intimate lives. Uh, Jonathan Crary, uh, commenting on Arendt in his book 24-7, Late Capitalism and the Ends of Sleep, noted that without this time or space for privacy, the singularity of selfhood is eroded. I see the glare of Western Hotel and the woman's total visibility as a kind of premonition of our contemporary condition of omni-surveillance. The room has so many windows, it is scarcely an interior at all, <laughs> perhaps connoting some corresponding lack of subjective interiority. Commenting on the uh, Bates Motel in Hitchcock's Psycho, Crary remarks that the motel stands on a depthless lateral terrain of flux, exchangeability of temporary and provisional life. My comparison of Hopper's two paintings suggests that he thought deeply about the shift in cultural sensibility that accompanied the transition from train to cars, from hotels to motels. It is, after all, generally agreed 
that many of Harper's early landscape reflects on the effects of America's transition between an agrarian or from an agrarian to an industrial society witnessed by these poor cows <laughs> to tra traverse a railway line. The mode of life depicted in hotel room is certainly unhomely. It does seem to protect the singularity of selfhood, uh, according to Hopper. The moment of the car, however, as depicted in Western Motel, seems to threaten uh, a mechanization of vision, the reification of the body, and the hollowing out of the self. My plea, therefore, would be for the consideration not just of hotel consciousness, but also motel consciousness, and to see the difference that uh, transition has made. Thank you.